Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Years ago, when I was studying to become a yoga instructor, <laughs> the teacher told the story of an experiment that was conducted in Washington, D.C., then the murder capital of the United States. Thank goodness it wasn't Detroit. It seems that they gathered 7,000 meditators to meditate day and night for a full seven days. And during that week, he concluded triumphantly, there was a marked decrease in the crime rate of the city. I am sure he felt the story was a compelling way to make his point about the positive power of meditation until I raised my hand and quipped, you know the real reason the murder rate went down that week? It was because they had taken all those murderous meditators off the streets. <laughs> it was a joke, of course, meant to give my fellow students a bit of comic relief and a chuckle. But as I hear the worldwide and campus-based denunciations of Israel's attempt to defend herself, after, in the face of one of the most brutal and barbaric attacks in modern history, I feel like my quip has come to life. Here you have the meditators, if you will, the Israelis who are simply striving for peace, to defend themselves as they have every right to do, while minimizing civilian casualties, being blamed for going after terrorists who purposely and intentionally attacked, kidnapped, and abused countless Israeli citizens without regret or remorse. Ironically, and I am afraid quite cynically, it is the Israelis who are being accused of genocide for fighting against a terrorist organization whose founding documents call for the extermination of the Israeli people from river to sea as their supporters love to chant. Don't get me wrong, war is terrible and innocent civilians are always its unfortunate victims. Indeed, in our war against Iraq, six Iraqi civilians were killed for every Iraqi soldier who fell in battle. Now, when you eliminate the exaggerated numbers of the Hamas health officials, which have been exposed as inflated even by the UN, and subtract the number who actually were indeed combatants, and also the number who perished at the hands of Hamas's own rockets, the ratio in Gaza is actually remarkably low, historically speaking, but still tragic. Still tragic. Yes, that is true. This past week, a rabbinic colleague of ours in a different city shared a heart-rending letter he received from one of his college students. It contained a picture of one of those Palestinian children being carried by his grieving father with a message reading, Rabbi, I am so disappointed in you. For not speaking out about this, I will never forgive you. Now, as we have learned, that fire was actually caused by Hamas weapons and fuel stored close to a civilian center in direct violation of international law. Still, reading this for us as rabbis was like a punch to the gut. And so although this was not my student, I began to compose a response in my own mind. It began with the words, I too am disappointed. Although I am proud that your education here at our temple has enabled you to feel true empathy for the suffering of other people and nations, I am disappointed that I never received such a picture from you of one of the infant victims of October 7th, nor of a Ukrainian child for that matter. With all your empathy that you feel for the other, Shouldn't at least some of that be turned toward your own people? Although you may never forgive me as your rabbi, please know that I will always forgive and welcome you with an open heart. To return to my yoga meditation story for just a moment, since those classes, since that time, I have endeavored to meditate, or as I call it, to pray every day after my own yoga practice. And when I do, I begin by setting an intention. One day, my intention might be simply to relax. On another, to find courage or perspective in difficult times. But most often, I ask God for the gift 
of empathy, for the ability to put myself in another's shoes, to see the world through their eyes. And that is why I do feel deep empathy, I believe we all do, for the innocent Palestinians, especially the children, who are suffering as a result of this war. As has been said before on this bima, one's heart can be broken for two peoples at the very same time. But by the same measure, I also put myself in the place of the Israelis. And I ask myself, if it were me, if we ourselves as Americans were faced with an October 7th style attack, what would we do? How would our military respond to an enemy force that was hiding their armies and military materiel in hospitals, schools, and religious institutions? Indeed, what would Spain, Norway, or Ireland do? The answer is that they would launch a fierce counterattack in an attempt to root out the perpetrators and to end the aggression. In the process of prosecuting those wars, undoubtedly, they would make mistakes and innocent people would suffer as a result. But they would go to war, every single one of those nations, in the face of such atrocities. You know, back in the days of our Torah portion, Bechukotai, things seemed so much clearer. If you do God's will, the text states, you will get God's blessings. Your life will be good. And it is only if you sin that God's curses will fall upon you. If only that were true, that good people and peace-loving nations would be rewarded while perpetrators of barbarism and brutality would be punished from on high. Alas, as the Jewish people have learned from painful experience ever since, the world just does not work that way. God may have made the walls tumble down in the Israelites' battle against Jericho, but since then, the descendants of those same Israelites have been forced to defend ourselves, which leads us right back to Gaza and to the question of what we can do from here. Those of us who do feel Israel's pain, but must watch helplessly from afar. One heartening response was our recent Yom Ha'atzmut Walk the Zoo in White and Blue celebration put on by the Federation and co-sponsored by Temple Israel. 2,000 people showed up to show their support of our homeland, including hundreds of children and families. They all loved it, although personally, I discovered that the Detroit Zoo is not really my thing. I mean, I must have walked for three miles and saw a total of two camels and one very neurotic polar bear. <laughs> that was it. But at least I got my steps in as well as enjoying communing with my fellow Jews in support of our beleaguered Jewish state. And there is more that we can do as well. We can contribute financially. We can advocate for Israel in our state houses, on college campuses, and in, and in Congress. We can encourage our friends and neighbors to hold their sympathy for the innocence of Gaza in the very same heart that also holds empathy for the plight of the Israeli victims of October 7th. And yes, we can do what we are all doing here this evening. We can pray. Although I must say with all due respect to my yoga teacher, I am not sure that meditation and prayer alone can overcome violence and terror. If that were true, the Israeli hostages would have been home by now after all the prayers we have offered on their behalf. What I do believe and what I have found from my own personal experience to be true is that prayer can help us to achieve an abiding sense of empathy, not only for other people, but for our own people as well. This evening, therefore, we conclude by sending forth a special prayer for those very same hostages who, despite all of our prayers and better efforts, still remain in terrorists' hands. The traditional prayer for the redemption, redemption of hostages reads, Achenu kol Beit Yisrael, to our brothers of the house of Israel, to our sisters of the house of Israel, all who were taken hostage by an evil foe and still lie in captivity, whether on land or held upon the sea, or I would add here, in tunnels below the earth. May God above deliver them from dark to, of night to freedom's light, 
from terror's hand back to our land. Ba'agala uizman kariv, at this very moment, speedily and soon, and let us all say, Amen.